course, this channel is mainly about photography, but I do get asked quite a few questions about my video process, sometimes about color grading and the types of color profiles I use in my camera. So essentially, I just wanted to make a video going through absolutely everything in my workflow. And this is going to be a part two of a video that I've already recorded about my photography workflow. So if you want to see that video, I'll leave it linked down in the description below that goes through everything that I do in my process as a photographer. Also in this video, I'm going to kind of skip over my backup process because I did cover that in the photography video. So if you want to see my backup process for video, it's pretty much the same as I do with the photography go check that video out. Of course, there are many ways to make a video. No two workflows are exactly the same. And this is just how I edit my videos to get the result that I like. So if you guys can pick up anything or learn anything from this video, that's essentially why I'm making it. I'm currently shooting all of my video on the Sony a7 IV, which is the camera that's recording me right now. I have a lot of different lenses, which I can list out some of them here, the ones that I'm using at the moment. And for the most part, I am using a black mist filter. So I currently have the Nisi 1 8 uh, black mist filter and I really like the look and feel of these filters and I've kind of incorporated them into my style over the last, I guess, year or so. Now in terms of the codec and profile that I use, I'm currently using the Sony S-Log3 with the s Gamma 3 Cine color profile. I'm not really using this profile for the added dynamic range or anything like that. It's mainly just I really like the look of the colors once I have color graded the video. I've tried many of the other color profiles within the Sony a7 IV and I just can't quite seem to get where I want to go uh, if I'm not using S-Log3. And then the codec that I'm using is the XAVCS 422 10-bit at 140 megabits per second. For me, this codec works really well in log. It's a big step up from codecs in the past that would have a lot of banding and blocking when you used a log profile. Now, in terms of my strategy when I'm shooting, I have pretty much ditched a gimbal for the better part of the last two years. And I've actually been shooting mostly handheld or bouncing between handheld and on a tripod. And I turn the in-body stabilization as well as the electronic stabilization in the camera completely off. And I do all of my stabilization in post, which I will show you guys in a second. I don't shoot a lot of slow motion. Most of the time I'm shooting in 25p, but if I do want to slow some footage down, I will quickly switch over into 50p. And I just really like bouncing between those two frame rates. It's very simple. 50 divides into 25, so it's half speed. And I don't use 24 frames per second. A lot of people on the internet will tell you that it's more cinematic than 25 and I don't really see the difference. It doesn't really make any sense to me. So I stick to 25. That's what I like. I think that pretty much covers everything in terms of the in-camera settings. But if you guys do have any other questions, leave them down in the comments below and I'll try to answer as many as I can. All right, so let's jump into the computer and get started. I've got some footage here that I've selected from my recent trip to Japan. Just a few shots that I've picked out. And as you can see by a lot of these shots, they're not very stable at all. So the first thing that I will do is actually stabilize all these clips before I get started. There's essentially two different ways that I'll shoot. Either I will shoot handheld um, with no gimbal, anything like that, or I will be shooting on a tripod. I haven't really been using a gimbal at all for probably the past, I'd say over 12 months. I've just been running handheld and then stabilizing in post. So if you're wondering about my camera settings, I have IBIS and also the electronic stabilization in the camera switched off and I do it all in post-production. So the app that I use is actually called Catalyst Prepare and this is the paid version of the software called Catalyst Browse from Sony. And this will allow you to use the gyro data within the camera to actually stabilize the footage. And I found that it gives a really great result. So this software has loaded up now. And as you can see, all of my footage is in this one folder and it's ready to be stabilized. Now this is a monthly subscription. And what this allows you to do over the free Catalyst Browse software is have access to the 422 10-bit export. It also allows you to do batch exports as well. However, the software is terrible. Ever since I upgraded to Mac OS Ventura, it is completely broken. The batch export does not work at all. So I have to sit here and do it one by one. And also if I try to analyze the stabilization data for more than one clip, 
it also crashes. I will say though that the result is really, really good and that's why I have continued to use it despite these issues. They release an update maybe like once a year. I'm really hoping that an update comes soon, but I'm not holding my breath, put it that way. So all you need to do to stabilize your footage is click on the file that you want, come down here to the right bottom corner and click stabilize. Then if we play back the clip, you can see the before and the after and just how much better this footage is, how much more stable it is. You also notice that it did apply a little bit of a crop and it will automatically calculate the crop based on the footage. So the more crop you add, the more stable the footage is going to be. You can also do it manually. So that's generally what I like to do. The way that I shoot, I shoot a little bit wider knowing that I will crop in a tiny little bit in post. I think between 89 and 91% usually works really well for me. So generally I will just put everything in the folder to 90% and then just export them all at that same setting and pretty much ensures that most of the footage is really well stabilized. Another thing to keep in mind with this method is that you do have to shoot with a slightly higher shutter speed in the camera. So I wouldn't go below one 125th of a second or one 160th of a second, somewhere around that range, because if you do go a little bit slower, you do get some kind of motion blurring in the footage once it is stabilized. And for those wondering about the 180 shutter degree rule, it's not a rule, you don't have to follow it. It's just something that people think looks better Personally, I don't really care. High shutter speeds, like over one thousandth of a second with fast moving objects, yes, you can notice a difference. So it's just something that you have to be aware of, but I think people stick to it like way too much. Like they'll be shooting like an interview and they're sticking to like the 180 degree shutter rule. It just doesn't make sense because nothing in the footage is even moving quickly. So it's not really gonna make too big of a difference. And your average person's not gonna know the difference at all. So I don't really care about the 180 degree shutter rule. Okay, so once we're happy with our cropping ratio, we can come up to this button here, which is the export. And then we just wanna make sure that all of our settings are correct. So for me, I wanna output a very similar file than what the camera actually created. So for that reason, we're gonna use same as source for the output color space. S gamut 3 cine and S log 3. Then for the format, it's XAVCS uh, 3840 by 2160. And then for the frame rate, it's also same as source. Um, when you apply this to multiple clips, regardless of whether it's 50p or 25p, um, it's going to keep that frame rate if you select same as source. Another thing about frame rates, I generally like to stick to those two frame rates for slow motion 50p for normal motion 25p, I will just bounce between those because it's very clean, it's easy. 24p is not more cinematic than 25p, regardless of what people on the internet might tell you. And then for our render preset, this is probably the most important part. Um, so I'm gonna go for XAVCS 422 10-bit 3840 by 2160 25p, 140 megabits per second. Now you'll notice that there is an intracodec, which means that every single frame is encoded with its own data and that data is not shared across multiple frames. However, I have not noticed a big enough difference between intracodecs and interframe codecs and you're gonna save quite a lot of space. That 250 megabit per second is just a little bit too heavy. And so the 140 for me is perfect. And then for the rest of the settings, I'm just going to leave them at default and then hit the export button. Once we have um, also chosen our destination folder. So I've already done this ahead of time. So I'm not gonna bore you by going through and exporting each of these one by one. As I said, you can do it uh, in a batch with Catalyst Prepare. However, that feature is somewhat broken or completely broken for me at least. So um, good work Sony on that. Hopefully they come out with a fix really, really soon. But as I said, I've already got a folder here full of stabilized footage. So this has already all been processed and now it is time to import it into our editor of choice, which is DaVinci Resolve. So I'm gonna go ahead and open DaVinci Resolve right now. Okay, so now we have the project manager page open and we're just gonna create a new project. I'm gonna call this Japan test project just for the sake of this video. And then we've got a new project. So I have my Resolve set up very specifically. I only choose to show the four tabs at the bottom. 
um, and I've just got things set out in a way that makes sense to me. So if things look a little bit different to your interface, it's because I've uh, customized it a little bit using this workspace tab here. So you can really customize the way things look. What we're gonna do straight away is open our folder full of our stabilized footage and then just select all of that and import it into our media pool. And the first thing that we're gonna do is to select all of our footage and then go to clip attributes and then just tick 25. That's going to turn all of that 50p footage into 25p footage, stretching it and making it slow motion. The next thing we do before we create a timeline is go to our project settings. So I don't have to do this every single time that I open a new project. However, uh, it's important that you do have your project settings set up uh, the way that you want them. So I've got my timeline resolution set to 3840 by 2160, which is 4K. I'm always outputting 4K videos these days. And if I need a 1080p export, I'll do that separately in the export window. And then I'm always working in a 25 frames per second timeline. The other thing that I'm going to do is come to the color management tab and I'm using DaVinci YRGB color managed and then my input color space is Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4, same as the timeline color space, and then the output color space is Rec. 709A. These settings are really important because you want your footage in DaVinci Resolve to look exactly the same as it's going to look on YouTube or any other platform, and you need to have those settings set in order to do that. There's a few other settings in the export window, but I'll show you that once we get to exporting the video. I'm gonna quickly put together a rough cut of this footage onto the timeline. All right, so obviously every single project is going to be different and it's going to be edited in a different way. Of course, my edit would be way more complex with this, with music and stuff like that. But for the purpose of this video, I wanted to show you guys how I color grade. And uh, for that, we're going to skip into the color tab. If you didn't know, uh, DaVinci Resolve separates its editing window from its color grading and export and also the audio um, windows. So we're going to jump into the color tab now. And I will say ahead of time, I'm not super technical when it comes to color grading. I'm a very kind of keep it simple sort of mentality. And I don't use the compound nodes or anything super crazy. I literally just use serial nodes. So we're going to create four of those in a row now using the option S key. And the first thing that we need to do is take this log footage and make it look presentable. And there's two different ways that you can do this. So the first is the free way. And how you do this, I'm going to use the first node and select it. Go to my effects and then select a color space transform and drag this onto the node. All we do here is choose the input color space, which should be S gamut 3 cine. And then the input gamma, which should be S log 3. There we go. And then the output color space, which is Rec. 709. And then the output gamma, which is Rec. 709A. And that's going to get us a really great looking image straight away from the log. So this is the before, and then that's the after. Now, if the exposure isn't correct, you can use this adaptation slider here to pull the exposure down or increase the exposure like so. So that's really handy. Now, there is actually another way that you can do this that's not free. Um, however, I actually like the result a little bit more. So we're going to reset the node grade and I'm going to use a LUT. And the LUT that I use is from Joel Famolaro. And this is kind of like an RE emulation S-Log3 to Rec. 709 LUT. And I'll leave this LUT link down below for anyone who wants to grab it. So all you do is right click on the node and then go to LUT. And then we're going to choose the Phantom LUT S-Log3. And then the one that I use is the Neutral A7S3. And yeah, I really like the way that it looks. So this is the before and then the after. It's pretty similar to the color space transform method. I just prefer the way that the colors look. So I actually leave this uh, second node blank just for now. And then I come to the third node. And this is where I sort of apply my own creative look to the footage using my LUT. So I have a LUT pack, which it essentially copies the same looks as my Lightroom presets. And they're here in this folder. You just choose it the same way that we chose the last LUT. And then I'm going to select Burley. 
And as you can see, that's just added like more of a stylistic look to the footage. And you can actually dial this in to your liking. So if you come to this uh, button here, which is the key tool, um, you can change the key output. And this is essentially just the opacity. So it's expressed as a decimal point. So say 0.5 would be 50% and then 0.6 would be 60%. I'm just gonna go with 0.7 and then I'll show you guys that's before and then after I've added my LUT. So it just kind of adds a little bit of a stylistic element to the footage, makes my footage look a little bit different um, to other people's footage. The next step is to add some sharpening because when you stabilize the footage in Catalyst Browse, it does take a little bit of the sharpness away. So I'll just come to this blur tool here and then select the second option here, which is sharpen. And then I'll take the radius down to 0.48 or 0.49 depending on what it needs. So if we just zoom in here and then toggle this off and then on again, it's a very subtle effect, but does add a little bit more sharpening back to our footage. So you're probably wondering why we've kept this second node blank and there's nothing on here. This is where we're gonna do all of our color and tone correction. So I like to leave this until last once I get a gauge of how everything looks once the correction and the LUT have been applied. Usually I'll just use the color wheels for this and just dial it in to my taste. So if you don't know how these work, essentially the offset is the overall color adjustment, gain is the highlights, gamma is the midtones, and lift is the shadows. To correct the white balance, I generally won't use the temperature and tint over here, but I'll just use this offset color wheel. So I think I'm just gonna warm this footage up a little bit and pull it more towards the magenta kind of red side. Um, somewhere around there looks good. And then I'm just going to pull the overall brightness down a little bit. And that's added a lot more contrast and a lot more oomph to our image. So that's the before and then the after. Now, still on the same node, I'm gonna come over to the curves tool and I'm just going to raise the black point up just a little bit. And then I'm gonna create a new point here and just pull sort of like the shadows, not the blacks, but the shadows down a little bit. And then I'm just going to roll the highlights off a little bit by bringing this top point down and then creating another point just below it and pulling that up. So as you can see, before and after now. So to me, this looks really good. I'm happy with this. So that's the before, the original footage with no corrections applied, and then the after. Okay, so if I was to copy this grade, hitting Command C, and then copying it over onto the next clip, you'll notice that it is a little bit too dark. And that's because every clip is a little bit different and needs a little bit of a different exposure. So then I'll just come over to my second node and then I'll just hit reset node grade. And then I can just start individually grading each shot. And to be honest, I really like where this one is straight off the bat. I don't think it needs any changes. So I'm gonna copy this grade once again, and then I'm gonna copy it over to the next. And I think this one is a little bit too blue and a little bit too magenta. So I'm gonna pull it down towards the green. And then I'm actually going to lift the exposure a little bit as well. I think this still needs a little bit more warmth, so I'm gonna pull it a little bit more towards the sort of yellowy orangey side of the color wheel. And that looks good to me. And then I'll just go through and sort of repeat this process and I'll just fast forward through that for you guys. Now that I'm pretty much done with my color grading, I'll just go through one by one and just make sure that all the clips match each other across the timeline because as you move through a project, sometimes you know the color grade will slowly shift to a different look. So you just wanna make sure that you're maintaining a cohesive look across the board. So I'm just fixing up this shot now to more closely match the shot before it, um, mainly just using this one offset color wheel and that's looking pretty good. There are some other effects and overlays that I will use from time to time. Over the years, I have grown a little bit of a library of overlays and effects. One of the most common ones that I use is film grain. So there's a few here that I've got. I've got this 4K film grain. So essentially what I do when I use this is I will just drag this over the top of my footage and then size this up to fit the footage. And then you wanna change the composite mode to overlay. So there we go and then we just duplicate that over the entire timeline or the area that we want that effect to actually be applied to. 
and then we have some nice looking film grain. Another effect that I might use from time to time is a mat. So we've got this one here. If we drag that over our footage, then we'll change the composite mode to multiply. And then we've also just got to crop in our footage a little bit at the top and bottom. Um, so we use this crop top. And we'll just try to dial that in so that it's just right. And then the bottom. And it'll add this kind of like film border, which I really like using from time to time as well. So that's how that looks with both effects applied. But we're going to leave all those effects off for now, so I'll just go ahead and delete them. And then also set the cropping back to how it was. Okay, so the final step is to export our video. And we're going to come to the Deliver tab for this. And I actually already have custom render settings for YouTube videos. So I'll just show you guys this one. It's going to export at H.265, 4K, 3840 by 2160, and 25 frames per second. You can also see that I have set a custom bit rate at 50,000 kilobits per second, which translates to 50 megabits per second. And I found that I get really good quality in 4K with that setting. If I wanna squeeze a little bit more quality out of it, I can bump it up to 60, 70 or 80,000 kilobits as well. I do really like H.265, even as an archival format for me, it just maintains a lot of the quality, but without the large size. All right, last up, we're going to come to these advanced settings here. And we're going to make sure we have our color space tag set correctly. So the color space tag is rec 709 and the gamma tag is rec 709A. And if you've got these set up correctly, then when you export uh, your video and you play it back in QuickTime, VLC, whatever it is, it's going to look exactly the same as how it plays back on YouTube or most other online video platforms. So the last step is just to give this one a name. I'm just going to call it Japan Test and then choose our location. I'm just gonna save mine to the desktop and add that to the queue and then hit render all. And this shouldn't take too long at all because it's quite a short clip. And uh, H.265 is actually a really fast export. So most of my YouTube videos, when they're between five and 15 minutes, they generally take like under two to three minutes to actually render the video, which is pretty crazy. And for those wondering, I'm using a 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro processor. Okay, so that's done and it took 30 seconds. That's the one thing that I really love about Resolve is how fast it is not just to work in the timeline and apply effects and things like that, but just how quickly it can also export videos. As I mentioned, everything is linked down below, those phantom LUTs from Joel Famolaro, also my personal LUT pack as well. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video, I hope you got something out of it. I really appreciate you guys for sticking around until the end, and I will see you in the next video.